Welcome to the Philosophy Ames channel. This is Season 1, Seminar 1, in which we examine the question, What is Philosophy? Because this is the first seminar, I absolutely want to thank three individuals without whom this simply would not have happened. First and foremost, I want to acknowledge and express my gratitude toward Molly. Absolutely, I there's no doubt in my mind that were it not for Molly, that uh, this simply would not have manifested. I never saw this coming, and the ability to get to share this knowledge with you and all this learning with you. Um, I've been carrying so many books <laughs> everywhere with me all over this country. I, I, I'm just so grateful. I, I, I really feel blessed, sincerely. I want to say thank you to Molly because uh, it just would not be possible without her. Also, I would like to thank uh, two very old friends of mine, Craig Miller and Michael Daly. So Craig Miller, he and I go way back and he's the first one who, you know, we, we got on the phone together one day and he just told me, he said, hey, I've been listening to these philosophy podcasts and I really think that you should do this. I really think that, uh, you know, you could put something good together and that it would be beneficial. So he was the very first person to put the idea in my mind. And initially I was like, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but I am very thankful that uh, he he gave me the idea and he encouraged me. And also my friend Michael Daly, uh, same deal. In, in talking with Michael, uh, Michael and I were graduate students together at uh, Duquesne University in their philosophy department. And in uh, talking with him, we both spent a lot of time around Dr. Uh, Wilhelm Wurzer. And in talking with Michael uh, over the years, he really encouraged me to also put together a podcast, put together a um, uh, a series of talks like this. And so, again, I, I think that if it wouldn't have been for their encouragement, I simply would not have, have done these things. So thank you. Thank you to them. Uh, there's also, you know, so many other people that I would like to thank. I just don't have the space or the time to do that here, uh, but I would be happy to include uh, like an acknowledgement section in the future for all of those individuals. So I want you all to know that, that you're in my mind and you're in my heart and thank you. I also just want to make one quick disclaimer. I had considered making actually a video about this, but I, I, I really feel like I need to say this. And that is that I have been writing books for a long time now. Uh, and when I say writing books, I mean just nonstop writing books. It's been uh, a wonderful experience for me. Many times uh, I, I would have a, a period of time during the summer, for example, whenever I wasn't teaching at a university. And basically I would wake up and sit down at the table and start writing. And I would have stacks of research surrounding me and I would not, you know, get up from the table other than just to eat and do things of that nature and go to sleep. And I would get up the next day and, and just start again. I mentioned that to you because I just want to say that transitioning from writing books to making videos uh, has been, uh, has been difficult for me. So um, I want to say that is the reason for the delay. I, I know a number of people were like, Hey, you know, they, they thought that this was going to manifest some time ago, and uh, it has been difficult f to transition into these 10-minute videos whenever my mind is in this space of footnotes and references and bibliographic, you know, material and, you know, exhaustively treating topics. So, so anyway, I just want to get that out of the way, and I just want to say, again, I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you so much. I hope that you get something out of this, and please do subscribe and like and share with your friends. Uh, it'd be nice if, you know, the support for the channel could really help keep it going. So again, I hope you get something out of this. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm going to, I'm going to not, um, go off topic like that again, I hope. Okay. So here we go. So, uh, we are addressing the question, what is philosophy in this seminar? And 
it shouldn't come as a, as a surprise that when you're doing philosophy, you know, we often find ourselves saying things like, there's more than one way to answer a question. So when you ask the question, what is philosophy? Of course, there's more than one way to answer that question. And uh, a better way to put that might be to say that there's more than one way to understand um, what that question is asking for, right? So what I've done is I've put together what I take to be the the primary ways to understand that question and to address and answer that question. And I think that this is the the, the best way to exhaustively or um, more fully uh, answer the question. Some of this stuff, for example, the etymological definition, I think everyone kind of knows that. But in either case, for the sake of thoroughness, we're going to put it all together here. Okay, so what you're going to see, we're going to talk about the historical definition, which I think is extremely important to orient us. That's why I put it first. We're then going to look at the etymological definition. Then we're going to consider uh, philosophy as a personal and spiritual ki kind of development. I'm going to, to speak in regard to that um, in general in this seminar. But going forward, um, there will be seminars themselves that will be devoted just to this type of an understanding of philosophy. So, for example, at some point, there will be a seminar on philosophy according to Plato and the Neoplatonic philosophers. And when we see that, there's a sense in which we can kind of think of it as a kind of spiritual development. Um, but I'm not going to go into all of those philosophers today because simply it, 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 we wouldn't be able to fit it all in this in this um, video. So, But I will be speaking uh, in regard to this idea in general um, as an answer to the question, what is philosophy? Then the idea of, you know, what is philosophy? Philosophy as a kind of activity and philosophy as a kind of understanding. You could think of philosophy as a kind of activity, as a kind of actualization or accomplishment. Uh, for example, contemplation or harmonious being. And by harmonious being, we could understand uh, happiness. Uh, when I when I speak these words, I find myself thinking of Aristotle. Of course, there's going to be episodes and seminars on Aristotle as well. Um, but for now, this general answer, philosophy as a kind of activity, um, does point back to ancient philosophy. Philosophy as a kind of understanding. Here I have this idea of coherent meaning making. So philosophy has a way to coherently make meaning in regard to reality, for example. Another way to, to characterize this, though, is you could refer to it as a kind of method, right? So that philosophy understood as a method. Then, of course, we have to, to provide Plato's answer from the Apology. And then if there's time, I don't know that there will be, but if there's time, a brief statement on philosophy at the universities, um, the current state of philosophy uh, in the early 21st century, as it were. Okay. All right. The historical definition. There's there's so much there's so much traction that you can get from this that I think it's really important to understand this um, and and remember it when you're dealing with any aspect of philosophy in particular, right? Any aspect of the history of philosophy, um, for example, some philosopher or some uh, text in the history of philosophy, it's very helpful to contextualize it by asking yourself, which historical period does it belong to? Okay. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, just real quick before we start looking at these dates and stuff, I just want to say that I'm in no way, shape or form uh, trying to push any kind of uh, politics or religion. I'm trying to remain as neutral as possible so that I don't alienate anyone. So if you if if there's something that you find triggering or if there's something that you find, uh, you know, you think that it's supporting one po political endeavor over another or something like that, you know, please try to bracket that. Please try to, to set that in the background because that's not what we're doing here. That, that's that's not what we're doing at all. And I think that though I want to be respectful and mindful of everyone, uh, there is a sense in which we don't want to get distracted from what we're doing, right? So, so let's just stick to the philosophy. Okay, so when we talk about the historical periods of Western philosophy, what we can see is, and and I'm I'm using this metaphor again of zooming in and zooming out. I really I really like that kind of language. So, 
what we're doing here is we're we're pretty zoomed out. Um, in fact, I guess you could argue that we're about as zoomed out as we could be. And when we're this zoomed out, we could divide the history of Western philosophy into four parts. This, by the way, what I'm doing right now is is standard. So you can find this you know, across the board in pretty much any um, philosophy textbook that you would ever pick up. So there's nothing controversial about what I'm saying. Uh, so you have these four divisions. Now, it is, you know, clearly you could um, zoom in more, uh, for example, into any one of these four divisions. The Middle Ages, for example, you know, we should be talking about scholasticism. We should be talking about uh, Renaissance uh, philosophy. The reason that this fourfold division of Western philosophy, the history of Western philosophy, is standard is because it allows you to make generalizations, and those generalizations are very helpful. So again, <clears throat> we're going to see the first generalization here in just, just the very next slide. But what we can see here is that if we are looking all the way back to 600 uh, BCE or BC, what we find is philosophers like Heraclitus, Parmenides, Thales, uh, the pre-Platonic, as Nietzsche would refer to them, the, the pre-Platonic philosophers, or as you've probably heard of them as the pre-Socratic philosophers. But of course, also, this includes Plato, this includes Aristotle, this includes Socrates, uh, you know, this includes the uh, the Roman philosophers and so forth. So, so we want to understand that ancient philosophy is pretty wide in scope. Uh, the Middle Ages, of course, um, as I already mentioned, scholasticism, Renaissance philosophy, medieval philosophy, philosophy leading up to Descartes, modern philosophy, in essence, starting with uh, Bernardino Talisio and uh, Francis Bacon and Descartes, Thomas Hobbes, uh, these these thinkers, um, and then going up to the year 1900. So really, that is the modern period is ending with the death of Nietzsche is the way that I would think of it. But another way to think about this is, of course, there's so many really significant figures in that modern period. For example, not just Descartes, but John Locke, Leibniz, Spinoza, Kant. You know, of course, we can't forget about Kant. Hegel, Marx, Schopenhauer, Schelling, Fichte, Hertelin, Novalis, and so on. So these all these modern philosophers. And then the contemporary period, really the contemporary period is going to extend from uh, after the death of Nietzsche until today, or in, and including today, right? So we have some generalizations that uh, are very valuable to make, actually, and we're going to make them right now. Okay, so in regard to these historical periods, um, if you ask what is philosophy in each of the historical periods, then we get four different answers, and this is this is extremely helpful. So the idea is, is that, in general, uh, philosophy seemed to be understood as a kind of style of living or a kind of ethics. So the standard phrase we often find referring to the ancient period in Western philosophy is ethics as first philosophy. So uh, what is most important in the ancient period is ethics, um, your style of living, your way of living, how to achieve happiness, what is the meaning of happiness, that sort of thing. So so soteriology in many ways um, is, of course, first and foremost and, and most primary uh, in the ancient historical period. When we move into the Middle Ages, what we find is that philosophy is understood, there's a shift in the understanding regarding philosophy, and philosophy comes to be understood as the handmaiden to theology. This That's the standard sort of phrase that you find people using, especially in the modern period, to refer to philosophy in the Middle Ages. So the idea being something like there have been sufficient revelations, uh, theological revelations, and so therefore we no longer really need to understand what is required for soteriology, right? So the idea is that religion answers the question of soteriology in the Middle Ages, and then there's really no use for philosophy, so so the story goes, that there is no use for philosophy uh, in the Middle Ages other than, we could say, faith-seeking understanding, right? Or this idea of using philosophy to help us understand 
the meaning of some of these theological terms. So in either case, the idea is, is that philosophy is a kind of handmaiden or a helper to theology, but but theology is is first and foremost more primary than um, philosophy. Now this starts in the Middle Ages, and there are plenty of people today who think that this is still what philosophy is, right? So it's important to see this. Okay, now when we move to the modern period, we see that that philosophy is the handmaiden to science. So, so really what we get here is the modern period and a kind of scientific revolution. So the idea being that um, with ethics as first philosophy in ancient philosophy, there was a kind of move from ancient philosophy to, to the Middle Ages and during that time, really, Plato and Aristotle dominated philosophy. Um, even when, so for example, when we think about the Middle Ages, there is a sense in which Aristotelian philosophy, Aristotelian ontology, Aristotelian philosophy of science even dominated uh, the Middle Ages. So, one of the ways that you can think about this also is to think that, for example, in regard to Christianity, Thomas Aquinas is often understood as synthesizing uh, or reconciling Aristotle with Christianity. So if it's the case that in the Middle Ages, what's most important is theology and the belief in God, then the idea is that what do we do with Aristotle's philosophy? And so Aquinas is really the one who's most responsible for uh, reconciling Aristotle with Christianity. So if you're if you're reading Aquinas, um, you just see these Aristotelian understandings all over the place, right? Uh, so it's it's good to know that. And then in regard to Plato, for example, then Augustine is understood as the figure who synthesized Plato and Christianity going into the, the Middle Ages. So again, in either case, and, and the reason I'm emphasizing this is because despite the fact that theology is first and foremost, it's still the case that when you're thinking about the philosophy of theology, it's still Plato and Aristotle who are dominating the philosophy uh, of that, that historical period. So <clears throat> that begins to change in the modern period. And in the modern period, we have these scientific revolutions we have Galileo, we have Giordano Bruno, we have, again, Talisio and Bacon and Descartes. So th the idea here is, is that um, these figures are actively working against Aristotle, right? So there is a deep sense in which everyone is trying to beat Aristotle at the beginning of the modern period. And the idea of mathematics and mechanical understandings, um, the, the advances of technology, for example, the idea that insights gained from these advances, the invention of the telescope, the Copernican system, the insights it gained from these, these advances, is there some way that we can then take those insights and go back to the Aristotelian philosophy and somehow improve upon it, right? And quite possibly even bring about a paradigm shift. I, I, can't, I can't talk about the structure of scientific revolutions right now <laughs> because this is, a, this is a seminar on what is philosophy, but uh, at some point there absolutely will be at least an episode, if not a, a seminar, on the structure of scientific revolutions, this idea of paradigm shifts. I know that some people are reluctant to embrace this idea of paradigm shifts. When you do the philosophy of history, I think that it is absolutely uh, important to recognize these paradigm shifts such that, for example, philosophy comes to be understood not uh, as the handmaiden of theology, but rather as the handmaiden to science, right? So the idea is that with science in the modern period, we're coming to understand the world in different ways, but philosophy is now needed to help us make a more coherent uh, worldview out of these new understandings that we've gained through science and technology. So that's what's going on in the modern period, and that's philosophy in the modern period now. So we're doing the contemporary uh, historical period, right? Uh, the bottom right-hand uh, puzzle piece. So uh, especially today, uh, this is so much the case that uh, I'm I'm tempted to remove from this slide the phrase, the ability to be critical, <laughs> right? Uh, nowadays, philosophy seems as though it is just 
political philosophy, or that's probably even giving too much credit. Really, philosophy in the contemporary period, philosophy nowadays seems as though it is simply politics, right? So the idea is is that anything that you could philosophically articulate uh, is somewhere on the political spectrum. It's either conservative or it's liberal or, or you know, however, however you want to characterize that spectrum. And the idea is that therefore, uh, politics is primary and philosophy is simply the handmaiden to politics. I really, I mean, that's just, in my opinion, that is really unfortunate, but I, I, I recognize and I acknowledge that there are many people who see the world that way. There are many people who see philosophy that way. And there are many people who think that there's nothing wrong with saying that what philosophy is, is simply clarifying and helping us understand politics. I mean, there is no role left for philosophy other than the clarification of politics. Uh, I don't, I don't think that that's true. Um, but in either case, um, that is one way to characterize contemporary philosophy or the answer what to answer what is philosophy in the contemporary historical period. But I still think that there's another way to characterize philosophy nowadays, and that would be philosophy as the ability to be critical. So you could say something like this, right? That nowadays politics dominates everything so much, so much so that like even just what you eat could be considered somehow uh, political now, right? I mean, like, you know, you can't, you can't get a sandwich from this place or a sandwich from that place um, without somehow supporting some political party by acquiring a sandwich from this place instead of a sandwich from that place, right? And so when, when things are so permeated and sort of ubiquitously political, I would suggest that there is still another role for philosophy, and that is the role to be critical. And to clarify what we mean by the role to be critical is that to be critical, this goes all the way back to, uh, for example, the episode on criteriology, and we looked at the etymology of criteriology. The ability to be critical is the ability to set limits, right? The ability to be critical is uh, the ability to understand the boundary of something. And so, I believe that philosophy still can transcend politics by being able to, for example, set limits to political thinking, right? And I do, I do still believe that there is, I mean, I wholeheartedly believe this, that there is content that philosophy gives us access to that is not, it's not political content, it transcends politics. It's, it's territory that cannot be politicized um, by its very nature. It cannot be politicized. You could go so far as to say it cannot be politicized because it is the condition for the possibility of all politicizing. And so therefore, you know, I, I still think that, just to conclude this, I still think that this idea that there's nothing but politics in philosophy now, despite the fact that in practice, many universities nowadays have in essence, adopted this. You're either going to have a conservative or a liberal professor, and you can know what you're going to hear in the classroom based on the politics of your professor. You know, and I mean, and, and just just walking through a, a philosophy department hallway, it you you know, there's you can look at the wall and just see the the you know the politics are are written all over the walls, posters and pictures and things that are being endorsed. That really is the the common practice nowadays, at least in the United States. And so, to my mind, that has unfairly and um, unfair to to philosophy. It has unfairly and overly narrowly uh, limited the scope of philosophy. But so anyway, so that this is the answer to the question: What is philosophy? I think all of that is very important, right? But now you can see from a completely different point of view, if we're asking the question, what is philosophy? We can, like we like we did with soteriology, criteriology, ontology in the first three episodes, we can now ask, what is the etymology of philosophy? Okay, so <clears throat> I feel like this is this is first and foremost the kind of answer that that people will get uh, when they ask, what is philosophy? Right. So when we look at the etymology of the word philosophy or the word philosopher, we of course get philosophia or philosophos. So Sophia, of course, is the Greek for wisdom and 
Thalia is a kind of love. It is one of the Greek words for love. Some people will tell you that there are four Greek words for love. Um, really, I think C.S. Lewis is primarily responsible for advocating for this idea that there are four Greek words for love. But the way that I've always understood it and uh, the way it's always been taught to me is that there are three Greek words for love. So, so we're going to go with this idea that there are three Greek words for love. And so Thalia can be contrasted with eros and agape. And so I'm going to have an episode on the Scala Amoris in Plato, and we're going to talk a lot about Eros and Philia and Agape, primarily about Eros and Philia. But for now, just notice that Philia is a kind of love. You see it in the word, for example, Philadelphia. Uh, Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Delphos is the Greek word for brother. And so we have Philia. Uh, Delphos, this this uh, brotherly love, uh, that of course is different from um, erotic love or the love of eros. When we think about this in terms of how it relates to the history of philosophy, notice that uh, the love of wisdom could be understood as a style of living, a kind of living. So when you could say something like, I am concerned to cultivate a practice of contemplation, right? Nowadays, we might call that mindfulness. But if we were to say, I am concerned to cultivate a practice of contemplation, that that is a style of living, right? And that the cultivating the practice of contemplation is born out of the love of wisdom, right? When we say that we are a philosopher or we that we ask what is philosophy if you say that philosophy is the love of wisdom then we could see that there are other kinds of love that constitute different styles of living right and i mean I, this comes from plato and aristotle and i think they're they're spot on right still today of course so the idea is that the the lowest kind of love so to speak if we were to, to kind of think of these as moving up toward uh the love of wisdom the lowest kind of love is the love of pleasure and the love of money, according to Plato and Aristotle. Now, <clears throat> Plato Plato has it that the lowest form of love is the love of money. What's interesting about this is that for Aristotle, money is a kind of means to an end, and the end is pleasure when we're talking about this lowest love that's involved in a, as a style of living. So so in either case, we, fee, we see that this, this lowest of the three styles is the love of pleasure or the love of money. Uh, the next one up is the love of honor. And then above both of them is the love of wisdom, the practice of contemplation, as Aristotle would say. So I'm not going to go into all of the, the different implications uh, that come from this, but if you recognize that there's this tripartite, that there's this three-part way to divide up styles of living and that it relates to types of love or objects of love, objects of desire, if you if you really want to get into a more contemporary kind of language, appetites, uh, for example, then if you understand this tripartite division, it will help you understand many other things that you encounter in the writings of Plato and Aristotle. So let's let's put that uh, to the side for just a moment. And so we can say that philosophy or philosophia refers to the love of wisdom. And then it's also important to point out that the idea that the first person to use the term philosopher was Pythagoras. So we can say that he called himself a philosopher, a lover of wisdom, as opposed to a sage. And if you look at this in the Greek, you can see, so the idea is that he, he, he says he's not a sophos, he is a, a philosophos, right? He is not, a, he is not a, a sage, he is a lover of wisdom. This is important when we talk later on about the Socratic wisdom schools. There's a sense in which you can say something like, what is the Stoic sage? What is the skeptic sage? So it's important to recognize that this term sage still sticks around as we move into the Middle Ages. All right, so the etymological definition then, we come up with this idea that philosophy refers to the love of wisdom and that the love of wisdom may be understood as a style of living. If we understand philosophy as a kind of personal and spiritual development, there's a lot that we can unpack here. I, I took this as a 
this idea of being in the world as a starting point. So again, personal and spiritual development, philosophy as personal and spiritual development. So if we take this being in the world as a kind of existential point of departure. So what I'm going to talk about here is different ways in which we can understand being in the world and then how to understand being in the world philosophically. I'm going to read a little bit here with you, but so we can see that being in the world may be understood horizontally and it may be understood vertically. I'm essentially um, using this as a heuristic just to kind of make it easier to follow and as, as, a, as a memory aid for us. So if we understand being in the world horizontally, then we will be able to differentiate between four dimensions of being in the world or what we could say are four different worlds, right? Then if we understand this personal and spiritual development in relation to these four dimensions or these four different worlds, then there's a sense in which we can think of them vertically. And it's helpful to think of them vertically because then you you sort of naturally think of this ascension, right? This a move this movement of ascending. So I think it's I think it's helpful to characterize them in terms of horizontal and vertical. All right. So just to make sure this is explicit for us, the vertical movement then refers to a kind of soteriological development, the development of oneself as a person, oneself as a spiritual being, spiritual being in the world. Lastly, then, we can think of this, and it kind of depends on what historical period you're talking about as to what term you would use, right? So what you see now, you can start to see how once you understand these basic concepts, you can start to play jazz, as it were, with, uh, with the history of philosophy. So, for example, we can start taking some terminology from uh, the first two historical periods of Western philosophy, and we can start juxtaposing them with terminology from uh, the later uh, historical periods. And by doing this, on, on the one hand, you can retain the meaning of those terms from their original historical period, but also recognize that even if they, they, they don't exactly match with some of the contemporary terminology, it's still quite valuable. It provides a kind of illumination to juxtapose these terms. I really like the term apotheosis. So the apotheosis, we could say, of existential philosophy is a kind of soteriological soteriological principle. So if we think of philosophy as a character ethics, which I'm not really saying anything new right here. I'm just I'm just saying it in different saying the same thing in different ways. So character ethics is a style of living, for example, right? So when we ask ourselves, what style of living is better than another style of living? What way of being is better than another way of being? We are asking a philosophical question. It's a soteriological question. And when we recognize that there is a movement there, that we can move from a lower state of being or from a lower style of living to a higher state state of being or a higher style of living, we can think of this as a kind of apotheosis. You know, how do you translate apotheosis, right? Do you say a kind of becoming God? I think that if if you if you think that you can become God, then if, if when someone says to me that they think that they are God, uh, you know, maybe people only talk like that in philosophical conversations, but or 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 um, psychiatric hospitals, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, I've had a lot of people say things like that to me, and I, and I feel like when somebody says that to me. The first thing that goes into my mind is that I'm curious about, I wonder about uh, their definition of God. I wonder about what they mean by the word God, right? Because, you know, I can't, uh, I can't manifest uh, a tree or I can't, you know, I can't manifest a cheeseburger with just my mind. I mean, there's ways that we can, we can um, twist that, you know, like, well, you know, thinking about it and going to the drive through is technically using your mind. And so, yeah, but that's not, you know, I, I want to say something like if, uh, if I were God, I could create a cheeseburger right now in front of me and I wouldn't have to, um, go through a drive through <laughs> some, something like that. Right. So in either case, the idea is that I don't think that it's correct to translate apotheosis as becoming God. And I know there are people who have written entire books about this kind of stuff. And they, and they, they say things like, you know, all oh, the ancient philosophers, I mean, Jean-Paul Sartre is is guilty of this actually, right? You know that that all oh, the all the ancient philosophers are, or all philosophers want to be God, right? And I and I think that well, you know, I, I, you've got a curious definition of God, 
You know, I, and I don't, I don't think that that's true. I don't think it's true. Okay. In fact, what we could be saying here, though, is that in using more platonic language, I think we could be saying something like we could be becoming more godlike, right? Becoming more godlike. We could be manifesting and developing the divine principle or the divine principles, if you if you like, the divine principle within us, right? That we could be de- developing our spiritual self and from a lower state of being to a higher state of being, right? So again, it's soteriological. And when you think of it like that, I think it's it's perfectly legitimate to use the term apotheosis, and it and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a heretic or that uh, you know I, I don't know that you that you think that you want to be God or something like that. Maybe you do want to be God, but that, I don't think that that's necessarily what the philosophers are talking about. Okay, so I don't think it's necessarily what the philosophers are talking about. Okay, so. In this way, then, this transcending, right, moving from one state of being to another, this l- aligns with existential models of psychological development. Now, now, what I'm about to say here, some people would really get up in arms from my juxtaposing philosophers in general and existential psychologists with one another. But I think that there is some value to this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I do just want to just just show it to you juxtapose it and show it to you, right? So first, the first thing first then is this idea of the, what I think is best to refer to as the Welt matrix. So Welt, of course, is German for world. And so here we have these four worlds. These are the four worlds of existential philosophy. There are so many philosophers that I am borrowing from in order to articulate this. And this took, I, I must say that there was probably in 2017, I wrote a book on the philosophical principles of the history and systems of psychology. And I most likely didn't, I couldn't fully see, I certainly couldn't see this Velt matrix as clearly as I can see it now, right? Really uh, around 2019 as opposed to 2017, it it took that it took that time to sort of clarify because because you have there's a lot of disagreement in the literature and so in the philosophical and the psychological literature and so it kind of took me almost 2 years it's not like it was the only thing i was working on but but it kind of took me like 2 years to to be able to to fully clarify and be able to see this but i now i 100% stand by and behind this characterization now and this characterization is also this characterization also appears in one of i I, I don't even know where I'm at in, in time, um, but uh, in I think it was the last book that I published. Is that true? Um, the, the last book that I, I published with Dr. Jason Pittman, Jason M. Pittman, The Artifacts of, Artifacts of the Simulation. Um, yes, Artifacts of the Simulation, which uh, I very much enjoyed writing that book with Dr. Pittman. Um, shout out to Dr. Pittman. I just want to say that, so I used this idea, um, we we used this idea, especially in the introduction of that book, you'll see a lot of this idea, but it's very helpful because when you say something like, what is the world, of course, the, the Germans have a way of saying, well, it depends on what you mean by world, right? And I think that this is uh, this is the accurate way to sort of wade into all of that information. So, so again, we have... This question, forgive me for one second, I just want to show you, just so you see how consistent and coherent this is. So what we saw was being in the world, right? And we were talking about being in the world horizontally and vertically. We talked about being in the world vertically as a kind of ascension, and this ascension relates to these these worlds that can be understood horizontally. And so understanding these worlds horizontally, we have the Umwelt, uh, the Mitwelt, the Selbstwelt, and the Eigenwelt. Uh, the Umwelt refers to the surrounding, so Um is around the uh, the surrounding world. Mit is with, and so the Mitwelt is the with world. Selbst is self, and so the Selbstwelt is the self world. And then Eigen is one, or this idea of um, uh, Eigentlich or Eigentlichkeit this idea of authenticity. And so the authentic world or the 
the unified, uh, I'm trying to figure out a way how to articulate unity into all of this transcendental unity, ultimately, um, the transcendental dimension. So just very quickly, um, in straightforward sort of terminology, we could understand these in terms of the umwelt is a kind of physical environment. So the umwelt is directly and immediately what is around you right now. So, you know, the desk, the microphone, um, the camera, the lights, so on and so forth, the, the telephone, the computer, the screen, you know, the headphones, you know, the, that type of thing. So what is physically immediately around you, your physical and immediate environment, the mitvelt then can be understood as, um, the beings with that you are with in the umwelt. So at the, like the lower level, <clears throat> if we're, if we're kind of ascending right now, the lower level of the mitvelt would be the beings that you are being with in the physical environment, right? But then the higher level, if you want to, if you want to put it into that kind of language, the more abstract, perhaps, is the better way to put it. The more abstract understanding of the mitvelt would be in terms of uh, sociality, right? I'm working on uh, a chapter with a very good friend of mine regarding uh, philosophy and Anthony Bourdain. And we're working with this distinction between society and community. And community would refer to something that's more local, right? Uh, so it would refer more to the sort of with world as it relates to the, the physical, local, immediate environment. So that would be like the mitvelt as it relates to the umwelt versus the mitvelt as it relates to a kind of politics or conceptualization of being with others. That's the mitvelt. The Selbstwelt then refers to the self-world, and I, I take this as being a kind of psychological dimension that really is your own personal history, your own personal history, and then your own, the, the sort of uniqueness of your own personal relation to the Umwelt and the Mitwelt, right? Okay, so we've got this psychological dimension, and then lastly here we have the Eigenwelt. The Eigenwelt then I think it's fair to refer to it as the spiritual dimension. If you recall the way that we ended the episode on ontology, then the eigen could be understood as the spiritual dimension. It is the transcendental dimension. So the eigenwelt refers to the being that is the condition for the possibility of being with others. It is the condition for the possibility of having a personal psychological history. Uh, it is the condition, it is the being that is the condition for the possibility of being in a physical environment. When I, I tend to, you know, I tend to think about existentialism so much in regard to Heidegger, Heidegger and uh, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, that I sometimes forget how important Gabriel Marcel is uh, for existentialism. And when you get to really embrace Gabriel Marcel or engage with Gabriel Marcel's existentialism, what you find is that he has, he, he pushes this notion of authenticity into the with world. So he pushes this, this notion of authenticity into a conception of community and for me, you know, uh, how do I want to say this? It's not the first thing that comes to mind because I'm so steeped in all of this being and time stuff and Nietzsche and Kierkegaard, but it absolutely makes sense. If you, if you just stop and think about it for a moment, it actually, it absolutely makes sense. So, so I do think that there, it, it is appropriate to add Velt to Eigen, right? I think that if you, if you don't think into or engage uh, with Gabriel Marcel, if you don't think into the dimension that Gabriel Marcel is trying to open up for us, then Eigen Welt, you, you know, the use of the word Welt there doesn't really seem to make sense. It's more of like a, uh, a kind of dimension that is beyond the world is the way that I would think of it, or as the, as a dimension that is a condition for the possibility of, of the worlding process, uh, that comes out of experience. But, but all of that for another time, but I would say at this point that it actually does make sense to refer to a spiritual community, right? And that being an authentic person or being authentic somehow um, grants you access to that spiritual community. I think that's correct. Okay, so so there is the the Velt Matrix, and you can see how 
when we are born into the world, when we are physically incarnated, there's a sense in which we are directly and immediately coping with the umwelt, right? So if we are directly and immediately coping with the umwelt, and then over time, we come to a revelation of our spiritual being, even though it's the case that our spiritual being is the condition for the possibility of our coping with the umwelt, right? Even though you have to be in order to be in the physical environment, right? Even though that's true, it's still the case that we have to sort of come to that rev- revelation. The, that, that coming to that revelation can be understood as a kind of ascension. It can be understood as a kind of apotheosis. If we understand it in that way, then we can understand, to conclude finally here, right? Then we can understand that the, the manner in which, the method in which, we come to accomplish that apotheosis, the manner in which we come to ascend the the Velt matrix and ultimately transcend, I would say, the Velt matrix. The way that we do that is through philosophy, right? The way that we do that is through the love of wisdom, the study of wisdom, and philosophy as a as a method, right? As a method for for transcending the world. If we then juxtapose this with the existential psychologists, okay, so, so we want to kind of pause for a moment there. Now, if we, it was a, so we're kind of moving on to another aspect of this idea, but I feel as though we, we just fully articulated that idea, and now we're just moving on to another aspect of that idea. If we juxtapose what we just said with the existential psychologists, I think this is helpful because so many people are more comfortable with existential psychology. So... I want you to see that you know the existential philosophy is the condition for the possibility of ex- existential psychology and I hope that you get really comfortable with hearing and with stating condition for the possibility of right because it's a really uh, a powerful phrase in philosophy Okay, so Maslow's hierarchy then may be understood as a vertical organization of development uh, along the Velt matrix, right? So, as we just said, you move from physiological needs to self-actualization. This movement from physiological needs to self-actualization and transcendence coincides with the individual or with our increasing awareness from the Umwelt to the Eigenwelt, right? So, as I, as I more fully become who I am, right— as I more fully become what I am, but as I more fully become who I am in the world, as I more fully become being in the world, as I more fully become the being in the world that is the condition for the possibility of my being, right? So keep in mind the hyphen and the not hyphen from the uh, the episode on ontology. So as I become more the being with the hyphen that is the condition for the possibility of my being without the hyphen in the world, then there's a sense in which I am accomplishing a kind of self-actualization. There's a sense in which I'm also accomplishing a kind of apotheosis. So let's see here. So the body may be understood as a part of the umwelt and the subjectivity is a part of the umwelt. The subjectness, one's being a subject as part of the mitwelt. I, you know, I think that there the the number one I real I really will uh, say this is that I think that the number one mistake that is permeating Western philosophy right now is the understanding of philosophical psychology in terms of Descartes. I'm not the first person to say that. I mean, it's all over Heidegger. It's it's all over Kant. I mean, it's all over Hegel. It's it's everywhere, right? But but I mean, even though even though I I believe that Hegel is guilty of it, I think that it's really important to understand the difference between Descartes and Kant. I'm going to have so much more to say about this down the road, but for now, I just want to say that that's why you will hear me talking a lot about the difference between on the one hand, objectivity and subjectivity, and on the other hand, the transcendental dimension, right? Or transcendental phenomenology. What what the transcendental method gains us access to 
in contrast or as opposed to objectivity and subjectivity. So I think that that's, that's really important, but I just want to say it because you're probably going to hear me talk a lot about this as, as we go forward. And again, I think that it is the number one philosophical mistake that people are, are making as they, as they, as they learn to philosophize. Okay. All right. So, so some places, if you, if you go out and you start Googling um, Umwelt and Eigenwelt and Selbstwelt and stuff like that, what you're going to come across as well is you're going to come across the word Uberwelt. I liked the word Uberwelt for a while as a kind of like overworld or referring to a kind of spiritual world. But eventually I came to understand that a distinction had to be made between the Selbstwelt and the Uberwelt. And uh, the best way to make this distinction was in terms of the Selbstwelt and an Eigenwelt. So so anyway, I, I stand by the, the Welt matrix as I showed it to you on the other slide, on the previous slide. Okay, where are we at now? All right. Philosophy is a kind of activity, and I, I, need to, I need to wrap this up here. So, yes, I do. Uh, I may have to split this into two videos. I don't know what, what YouTube will allow me to upload yet. So philosophy is a kind of activity. Notice that we can see how all of the insights we've examined thus far line up with the soteri soteriological idea or soteriological principle. Self-actualization is a spiritual and a personal and spiritual development. It is the living into the Eigenwelt that manifests sim simultaneously with the actualization of the virtues of existential philosophy. We'll talk about the virtues of existential philosophy down the road, but ultimately what you can see here is that uh, it's the idea that philosophy uh, can be a kind of activity that leads to the revelation of your transcendental self. The That philosophy can be an activity, it can be a, a methodology, it can be an activity that leads to, this is just one of the ways, this is just one of the ways to answer the question, what is philosophy? But that uh, it, philosophy can be understood as a kind of methodology and a kind of activity that leads to the revelation of something, right? It leads to the revelation, as a, as a Kantian, I might say, to the revelation of some thing, but it leads to the revelation of your transcendental self, and the transcendental self is it transcends the subjective self, right? Uh, it transcends the the ego. It is the condition for the possibility of being without a hyphen in the world. Okay, where are we at? I'm I'm actually. I'm going to have to stop there. I'm going to stop here. And if I have, and we've been at this for almost an hour. I think that I can't upload a video that's over an hour. So it looks like um, I'm going to have to, to break this seminar into two parts. Going forward, I will try to make sure that I can uh, compartmentalize these things a little bit better so that they fit into these videos. As I, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I... I'm used to giving, you know, sometimes some of these seminar lectures would last for three hours. So, so please forgive me. I will get... I will get more in the habit of thinking and, and parsing things in terms of YouTube videos. But anyway, as I think this was a great start for us. I feel as though we got a lot of really great ideas on the table, and I feel as though we have a, a much deeper understanding now of the question, what is philosophy? So this will be part one of Seminar 1, and then we'll see what we can uh, fit into part two of Seminar 1. Thank you so much. Please do like and subscribe, and um, I'll see you in part two. Thank you.